of scripture today. I, when I get a chance to preach, I to use a lot of scripture. And you will be tempted to kind of uh, check out at some point. But these, these interconnectedness of scripture is what we're going to get to today. I really, what really makes me excited about preaching is when I get to show you something in scripture you've never seen before. I mean, that's the be all end all for me of, of being able to share. And I promise you, there will be one or two things today that you're either reminded of that you forgot or something new you've never seen before. Uh, something else I really love, besides podcasts and, and Christmas, is I love movies. I'm going to go see Spider-Man this afternoon. Super excited about that. And um, I love going to the movie theaters because you get to experience the movie with other people. Like, I'm not the kind of guy that can just sit alone in my room and watch a movie. I, maybe some people can do that. Ladies, you watch a Lifetime movie because your husband doesn't want to watch it with you. Or I can't watch movies alone. I need to see it with people. And I love... What I love about a theater experience is the enthusiasm of the people in the room. And then I love talking about the movie with my friends or family on the drive home. I'm like, did you, could you believe that scene? Or like, what do you think of the villain? Like, wasn't that a cool, like the talking about it. So when God was revealing to me what I was going to talk about today, uh, I love backstory movies where you find the bigger picture of the character and what was going on in their life before they became the hero or what was going on in the villain's life before he became evil. Or what. I, I love backstories, and I felt like God saying, preach about the backstory of Christmas. And you're like, ah. Huh. So, I mean, we're the day after Christmas, we can kind of move on to the new year or whatever. I just felt like pausing and talking about the deeper story, the purpose of Christ coming at Christmas, because I really believe the more you see Jesus' story, the more you're going to fall in love with him. I think that's the real goal. And so I'm going to put my favorite quote up here. This is my favorite quote. Um, I got to, one of my ministries overseas was I opened this gym in Africa, and I had a big chalkboard of motivational quotes. The only quote that I kept up the whole year and a half that I ran this gym was this quote right here. And it says, there's nobody you couldn't love if you knew their story. And I had it in big print on this chalkboard. And I had people coming up and taking photos of that and asking where I got it. I can't remember where I got it. But I really believe the more you know about somebody, the more you appreciate their story the more you understand them, the more you love them. And so the goal is to love Jesus more at Christmas, and you need to know more of the Christmas story. Um, the next picture I have for you is from <clears throat> another podcast I listened to, a guy named Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you're a fan or you've heard of him. But he was talking to this professor in Toronto who was studying the Bible, and he mathematically connected every scripture that was connected to another passage of scripture, and he mapped out the Bible according to interconnectedness. So you see all these little curvy lines? That's every time the Bible references itself somewhere else in the Bible until it makes this huge like spider web. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. And so look at Genesis, the beginning there, and how much is connected with about three quarters of the way in. You see all the lines running to the Gospels? Mm -hmm. that, like, that nerds me out. <laughs> like, like how the Bible was connected with itself. And so what I'm going to do today is pull out a couple of those lines and show you how the Bible connected into the Christmas story. If you're already going into like daydream mode, come on, this is going to be good. I promise you. I promise you. You're like, uh, interconnected to the Bible. This sounds like a lecture. Like, eh. It's going to be, i got to move this plant. This thing's killing me. I tripped on this thing the other day, and I'm going to whack it 50 times. So I hope that excites you. Um, the next picture I have is, you didn't know this about you. You're in the Christmas story. You know, we hear about swaddling clothes and mangers and shepherds and angels coming. Everything in the Bible is a, is a type or shadow. It points to something. Usually it's a greater reality of Jesus. But um, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you're the light of the world. Your life will point other people to the coming of Jesus. So the Christmas star, I put there and type it, you are the Christmas star. You're the light of the world. You're in the Christmas story. Isn't that kind of cool? I don't know if you ever thought of it that way. But your life is a light for other people to look at. Sometimes you're not, sometimes you're a 40 watt bulb. <laughs> sometimes you're gleaming because you're just filled with the joy of the Lord. If you're a 40 watt bulb today, I want to like take you up to a 100 watt bulb. We're going we're gonna to increase that light. Um, but the question, like when I was a teacher for a while, they talk about essential questions in teaching. The, the people you're teaching need to know why you're teaching what you're teaching. So I try to do that every time I teach or preach. So my essential question that I'm trying to solve is, what was Jesus doing? This is the next slide. What was Jesus doing before he was sent to be our Savior on Christmas? And the answer, he was creating, he was rescuing, he was saving, he was acting as a Savior before he came as a baby and lived that 33 years on earth. Because when I was a new Christian, I got saved when I was five. 
I was in kindergarten and Sunday school, and I gave my life to the Lord. Best decision I ever made. And, but when I was a young Christian as a kid, I thought that Jesus didn't exist until he was created as a baby. And then I learned that Jesus was God. He was part of the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh, he existed before he was a baby. I didn't know that. As a kid, I remember going, huh, that's pretty cool. And then what I assumed, because we make assumptions as Christians, I assumed that Jesus was just kind of like sitting on his hands in heaven and just like throwing paper airplanes. Like I didn't know what he was doing. I just figured he was up there with the Father having a good time, not knowing he was very active before he came at Christmas. So what I want to do is spend five or ten minutes here showing you that Jesus was creating, rescuing, and saving before he became our Savior at Christmas Day. So you guys ready for that? No daydreamers out there? Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is the creating part. And my favorite passage about Jesus' work at creating is in Colossians chapter 1. So if you want to kind of follow along as I read it, this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church saying, Christ is the visible image. We can't see God, but we can see Jesus. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. And he is supreme over all creation. And through him, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, who created everything? Jesus did. And the next part of that is he made things we can see and things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything, let me say that again, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So if you wondered if Jesus existed before the world was created, there you go. That just answered your question. He existed, and then he created. And the cool thing is, in Genesis, it says that God spoke everything into existence. Can you imagine if your wife could talk and everything that she said was created by they were talking? Husband's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> or vice versa. What if your husband could just say, brakes be replaced on my car, and the brakes are just replaced? Wouldn't that be awesome, man? Yeah. Jesus has that kind of power. His words can create the universe. And so the Bible says that he spoke everything into existence. I think that's pretty cool. That nerds me out. Um, yeah, I mean, what if you walked into the kitchen yesterday morning and everything was cooked for you already? And you were just like, your first thing you go is, who did this? That would be your first question, right? So people who don't know, they look at the sunset, they look at mountains, they see beauty out there, they don't know who created it. Jesus did. Jesus did. Um, I told you earlier that I'm a big fan of movies. And um, over the span of three years, I flew 200,000 miles on Delta Airlines. I flew a lot. I had a lot of international flights, and on international flights, they give you like unlimited Netflix, unlimited movies, and four meals. Oh, this life's awesome. I probably gained weight from flying. And I would sit there and watch about six hours of movies on every flight. And I have this thing, I really, I love documentaries. And I love documentaries that talk about survival stories. Like when somebody wasn't supposed to make it, they were in the mountains and they crashed their plane and they somehow survived. Um, I love survival stories. And I found one on Netflix on the plane it was called Last Breath. And if you're in the mood for an awesome, like, suspense documentary, like, write this down or take a photo of it. Like, that is an awesome, awesome movie. And I'll give you the one-minute version. It's a story about a guy named Chris Lemons. Uh, he's a scuba diver that works in the North Sea off the coast of Scotland. And his job is to maintain the pipelines that run underground 300 to 500 feet below the surface of the water. And what he does, he's on a ship, and he has to get pressurized so when he dives, he doesn't get the bends and come back up. So he's pressurizing this steel cage, this, this tank, and then he dives down three, 400 feet and, like, repairs the pipelines 300 feet below the water. Except that at one point, the, the boat that he was tethered to, he has an umbilical cord. He doesn't have scuba tanks. He has a cord that goes up 300 feet that connects him to oxygen. And at one point in the North Sea, the storms rose up so bad that the boat was rocking and it unhinged the anchor. And his boat was, he was being dragged at 15 miles an hour through the North Sea, tethered, tethered to this thing. It's, people are covering them out. It's terrifying. I'm sitting on the plane going, oh my gosh, is he going to make it? Like, my palms were sitting in the plane. It was so scary. And here's the crazy thing. A diver agreed to go down and rescue him. A friend of his says, I'm going back to get Chris. I'm getting emotional. So he connects his umbilical cord. He goes, dives down. And after 30 minutes, they brought him back up. And he, like, it's a miracle. After 30 minutes, you should not be alive. My friend Chris back there is EMT. After 30 minutes, you're dead. You're done. And they brought him up after 30 minutes. His, his emergency take was supposed to last five minutes. And he was alive. And the story's his testimony about, it was a miracle. And in just thanking his friend for coming to rescue him, part of what Jesus did is he left heaven. And he connected himself to a teenage Jewish girl's umbilical cord. 
and live for, like, the God who spoke the universe into existence allowed himself to live in a teenager's womb for nine months. That's, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? So that he could live the life on earth to experience what you're going to experience and what you have experienced, pain, joy, goodness, suffering. So when I watched that movie, I instantly thought of Jesus rescuing on an umbilical cord. So check out that movie. Um, Jesus wasn't just a creator, though. The Bible in the Old Testament, he's all there. And it calls him the angel of the Lord, the commander of angel armies, or the Lord of hosts. Those are the phrase it uses to describe pre-incarnate Jesus. So we're going to read a passage, Isaiah 37. All you Bible nerds, this is, going to, this is really cool. Lord of armies or Lord of hosts, Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, he's God too, who is enthroned above the cherubim. You are the God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made heaven and earth. Who, who made heaven and earth? Jesus. Who's the God of Israel? Jesus. Who is the Lord of armies? Jesus. Okay. That had to set you up. This is a little setup, a little trailer for the next passage of where Jesus appears in the Old Testament. He appears to people. And this is one of my favorites. It's in Joshua 5. Remember we just read that he's the commander of angel armies. It says in Joshua 5, Joshua went, he's, Joshua was the commander, the leader of all the people of Israel, over a million people. Can you imagine one dude leading a million people? It's hard leading a classroom of 25 kids. <laughs> I mean, what a job. So here's Joshua, and he needs help. They're going to go take the promised land, but Jesus comes and meets him. Watch this. Joshua went out to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for adversaries? And this is Jesus talking. And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And I have come. And Joshua fell on his faith, face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Cool thing is, in Hebrew, Joshua's name is Yeshua. Jesus' name is Yeshua. So Joshua met Joshua that day. One was the commander of angel armies. One was the servant of Israel leading the people. They met, and, and Joshua, the, the human, knelt down to Jesus. Isn't that cool? So Jesus was very active in the Old Testament. I'm going to show you one more story where Jesus was active. This is, might be one of the, unless you're a super Bible nerd, you might never have seen this before. That excites me. I've told you I love action movies. This is the most action scene in the whole Bible. It says at the end of times in Revelation, Jesus will go out with his angel armies and he will confront Satan and his armies. Showdown. This is the ultimate action scene. Good versus evil. Showdown, the final battle. And it's talked about in Revelation 19. And the cool thing is in the battle, nobody fights. Guess what happens? The Bible said the sword that proceeds from Jesus' mouth will destroy the enemies. All he has to do is talk. Jesus talks, the enemies are defeated. <laughs> I mean, that's, the angels are like, well, that was easy. This is, this is describing, this is setting up that scene of the final battle. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And this is what I want you to, I want you to remember this. Make a mental note of the next sentence. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, he's the, he's the commander of heaven, the armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. So this is setting up the final battle. But it says that on him was a name that no one could understand. Do you remember that? Let's go to the next passage now that sets that up in the Old Testament. So if you grew up studying Sunday school, Samson was the strongest man that ever lived. He made Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a 98-pound weakling. Like he was just that tough. Super strong, Okay. And this is the prophecy of the birth. This is Samson's parents talking to Jesus. You're like, what? Listen to the story. This is Manoah is Samson's dad, okay? Then Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, what is your name? For when all this comes true, we want to honor you. This is Jesus talking. Why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replied, it is too wonderful for you to understand. Isn't that cool? In the final battle, Jesus will have something that's too wonderful to understand. And Samson's parents goes, who are you? And he says, my name is too wonderful for you to understand. Let's keep going. Then Manoah took a young goat and a grain offering and offered it on a rock as a sacrifice to the Lord. And as Manoah and his wife watched, 
the Lord did an amazing thing. As the flames under the altar shot up toward the sky, the angel of the Lord ascended in the fire. What does Jesus do after Pentecost? He's, he's ascended after the resurrection. So he ascended, and then it keeps saying there, listen to this, when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell with their faces to the ground. The angel did not peer again to Manoah and his wife. Manoah finally realized it was the angel of the Lord. And he said to his wife, we will certainly die. We have seen God. So for those of you that didn't realize that Jesus was existing before, before uh, he came as a baby, he was all over the place. The Old Testament will be much richer to you when you start seeing Jesus actively working. His name is too wonderful to understand. I had this thought this morning. I really believe at the end of times when we see Jesus face to face, the Bible says it's going to be a wedding feast. I don't know if you guys like weddings. Wedding's pretty cool. It says there's going to be a wedding feast of the Lamb. All his children are going to have a feast with him, better than anything you ate yesterday. I really believe, this is what God showed me this morning, I really believe at that feast he will reveal the fullness of his name. No one understands his name, how good his name is. And I think at that wedding feast, the wedding feast, he will reveal the fullness of his name and we'll be like, oh my gosh, that is who Jesus was. Just a, just a side thought there. Um, so that's a cool story. Jesus appeared to Moses, I mean uh, Samson's parents. And then I want to get to it. So we've seen him. He, he created everything. He appeared in the Old Testament as a savior, and he rescued people. He's been doing that. That's, that's what he does. The Bible says in Hebrews that he lives to make intercession for you. So Jesus right now is not sitting on his hands in heaven. It says he will go and prepare a place for us. So somehow he's creating the next world that you're going to live in. And he's living to make intercession. He's sending angels to protect you right now. And so the, the next question, the first one is, what was Jesus doing before he created everything. He was creating, he was rescuing, and saving. But what was Jesus doing before creation? That's even further back in the story. And the real answer to that is he was a beloved son. Because it says in Isaiah, unto us a, a child is born, but unto us a son is given. So the son existed even before creation. So before Jesus created, before he rescued, before he was a savior, before any of this stuff, he was beloved by his father. And so what I really felt like God asked me to ask you is, what is your favorite all-time family memory? It could be in a kid. It could be something that happened recently. Do you have a time when you had a family camping trip or a vacation or just a meal with your family? And it was so much fun. There was laughter, great conversation. Think of that for a second. What was your favorite family memory? Do you have something up there? Can I fire now I want you to multiply that by a thousand, whatever that experience was. If it was really, really good, multiply that by a thousand. That is the reality that Jesus lived in before he came, before he created. He was in the presence of his Father and in the presence of, of the Holy Spirit. And there was only joy and laughter and each other's presence. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit shared each other's presence. And it was the best experience that we could have ever imagined. We've never experienced anything like that on earth. But that was the reality that Jesus lived in. He was a beloved son. And there's a scripture that talks about this. This is Jesus' final prayer before he was crucified. It's called Jesus' high priestly prayer. And he, he talks about this. He says, I, he's praying for you. Jesus prayed for you before he died. You personally. And listen to this. I am praying not only for these disciples here, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you. I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us. May they experience that reality that I was talking about so that the world will believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. And this is where it gets really cool. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Listen, did you just hear that? Wait, wait, that you love them as much as you love me. So you're saying God the Father loves you right now as much as he loved Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You're like, yeah, but Jesus was perfect. Like, Jesus was like, it's easy, easy to love. This is the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then you can see all the glory you gave me. Listen to this. Because you love me before even before the world began. So Jesus, Jesus lived in a reality before creation that was just perfect. It was loving before the angels were even created because they're created beings. 
Jesus knew a reality of glory and love and joy and peace that nobody's ever experienced. And he says, I want people to experience that too. Isn't that cool? I mean, that should get your blood pumping a little bit. That excites me. And, and I say that because, listen to this. The main reason Jesus came to earth at Christmas was it so that you could have the same kind of relationship with God the Father that he has. I want to read that again. If you don't remember anything else I said today, bad jokes or illustrations, stories, remember this. The main reason Jesus came to earth was it so that you could have the same kind of relationship with the Father that he has. And you're like, huh, I never thought of it that way. See, when I was a younger Christian, we, we talk a lot about in, in like high churchy terms about atonement and others, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but the main thing that Jesus wants to do, he wants to recreate your connection with the Father because it's so awesome. And so there's a passage where he talks about this with his disciples because his disciples are pretty confused about what Jesus is up to. In fact, if you read the Gospels, they're confused about 95% of the time. <laughs> they don't get it until the Holy Spirit comes and teaches them. True story, if you try to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, you're going to be frustrated and it's going to seem religious and dry. But if you humble yourself and say, Holy Spirit, if you don't teach me, I won't get this. I need your help. He'll start showing you stuff. And this is what Jesus told his discipleship about this father-son experience. Jesus told him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you really known me, you would know that the, who the Father is. From now on, you do not know him. From, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip, one of his disciples, says, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip? And you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show, show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Everything Jesus said, he said from the Father. Everything he did, he did commanded by the Father. It's a Father-based ministry. And um, when I, like I said, when I was a younger Christian, I didn't even know Jesus existed before he came as a baby. And then I kind of learned this thing of Jesus primarily came to atone for my sins, to forgive me of my sins. And what I subconsciously believed was that God the Father was primarily angry at me. He was a wrathful judge. A lot of you grew up thinking God was a judge, and he is a judge. But you thought that God is just has this wrath and anger for my sin. I don't go to church enough. I'm not spiritual enough. And you just felt like you're always in this kind of like shadow because the Father is always angry at you. And that's because you primarily think Jesus came to forgive you. He did come to forgive you. He did come to die and atone for your sins. But he did that primarily to reconnect you back with the loving Father. Um, I think, this is a side story, I think one of the hardest things to be a pastor, Joel, <laughs> she could tell you way more stories than I could, Todd could tell you this too, being a pastor, people act weird around you. No other profession do people act weird around you. Like, People will not know me, and they'll chat for 10, 15 minutes, and they'll ask what I do. I said, well, I don't lie to them. I used to tell people I'm a teacher. I teach people about Jesus, and I used to be a teacher. But now I just tell them straight up. I said, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm in ministry. And they always go, because they know they either cursed or said an inappropriate story, or, and there's always this sense of like, ooh, God, are you mad at me because I cursed in front of you and your pastors? Like, because 90% of the world, more than that, 99% of the world out there is living under this cloud that God is an angry judge, and he's just waiting to punish you. And that isn't, the God's not what Jesus was after. So what I kind of did is, I made a checklist of, of the things. Jesus had to remove all the barriers that kept you from having a right relationship with the Father. He did atone for your sin, and he saved you from this debt. We, we screw up in relationships, and we have a debt, and we have to ask for forgiveness, and, and love our spouse, and love our friends. And So there was this debt between us and the Father. Jesus came and made it, he took care of it. You're in the surplus now. You're not negative with God the Father. Okay? He defeated death on the cross. He saved your body. You're going to have a resurrected body someday. That's what the Bible talks about. You're not going to be floating around airy-fairy in heaven. You're going, to have a you're going to have a resurrected body, and he made that possible by his death on the cross. He came to earth to teach you about the kingdom, the kingdom of his Father. He had to save your thinking because your thinking was warped. My thinking was warped. He had to save. He's a Savior. He saves our thinking. He modeled the Father's heart for you by loving people and pursuing sinners here on earth, saving you from shame. I think one of the most deadly toxic forces to the human soul is shame. 
feeling inadequate before God. And Jesus said, you don't have to be ashamed of anything anymore. I've taken care of everything. And then the last thing I put on there, bringing God's promise of a changed heart. The new covenant promises that God will give you a new heart. You say, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to change. I don't want to repent. I don't want to read my Bible. The new covenant, Jesus says, I will come and change all that if you let me, if you just humble yourself. So all these things Jesus did, but the ultimate purpose was so that you could have a good relationship with the Father again. So you actually have to change your mind and repent of thinking God is an angry judge. He's a loving judge. God, God has wrath. The Bible talks about wrath a lot. And I know a lot of Pastors preach on the wrath of God. It's a real thing. But you know what God's wrath is for? For sin. Because sin hurts his kids, and you're his kids. So God has a ton of wrath, but it's all towards the things that hurt you. Because he's a loving father. And I think a lot of people just need to reconstruct, rethink, repent about the way they think about the father. And um, here's the thing. Jesus really was desperate to the father. He needed him on a daily basis. I made a little list, a very, very short list, of the things that Jesus dealt with in three years, from age 30 to 33. It was the years of his ministry. We don't really know what Jesus did between his childhood and age 30, because we don't have Gospels for that, but this is, this is what he dealt with. In Mark 3, his family thought he was out of his mind. They thought he was nuts. Go read, go read Mark 3.21. His mom goes, he's out of his mind. They weren't sure if he was the, the, the one, the Messiah, at that point. Everywhere he went, he was getting death threats. The people were trying to kill him, attack him, stone him. So he had multiple times he had to escape mobs that were trying to kill him. Is that stressful? I mean, guys are going to work and there's a mob of people trying to kill you at work. That'd be pretty stressful, right? Jesus dealt with that on a regular basis. His closest cousin, John the Baptist, was beheaded. That's traumatic. Imagine one of your closest family members, was their head was cut off. We kind of read that and go, oh, that's sad, John the Baptist. That's traumatic for a person. His best friend denied the relationship. Peter denied him in the moment of his greatest need. His close, one of his close friends sold him out for money. And keep going here. There's more things. He was constantly being asked to heal, teach, perform. Everywhere he went, Jesus, do this for me. Jesus, heal. Jesus, Jesus. So he was constantly emptying himself and, and serving people. And then he, it started growing. He started having a close network, and then hundreds of people, and then the multitudes were following him. Sometimes 25,000 people at a time were coming to hear from him and, and needing to be fed. Imagine trying to feed 25,000 people. It's stressful. I put on there, his closest students, his disciples, were stubborn. They were very, very slow to learn. Imagine investing for three years, teaching someone for three years, and they don't get it. <laughs> Frustrating. And then he was put on trial by religious and political leaders, and we all know he was tortured to death. That's a lot. That's a lot for a three-year... Imagine the worst three-year period of your life. It wasn't that bad. I'm sure it was bad. Probably had people abandon you, hurt you, Jesus dealt with more in a three-year period than any human being in history, from age 30 to 33. And I put on here, this is the next slide, and this is what you really have to understand. The only way Jesus survived the hardness of his earthly life was by staying intimately close with his Father. It's the only thing that sustained him. In fact, Matthew 14 is one of the craziest passages in the Bible. That's the passage where his cousin's beheaded, the multitudes come after him, and then his best friends are trapped on a boat in a storm. And it's the only passage of the Bible where two times the Bible says that Jesus went alone to be with the Father twice in one chapter. The most chaotic time of his ministry, Jesus says, I've got to get to the Father. And then he goes back, and then his friends are stranded on a boat, and then he goes and rescues them. But in between, he was with the Father twice. And um, I just want to wrap up the sermon here, just a couple minutes. Some of you have a negative relationship or view of the Father because you have a negative relationship of your earthly father. And that has affected how you look at God the Father. My dad is in the audience. My dad's my hero. My dad, my dad, my dad is like, listen to this. He's beaten Parkinson's. He's beaten cancer. <clears throat> he's beaten diabetes. He's beaten rheumatoid arthritis. And he's beaten a broken hip. And he's here. So, Pops, I'm proud of you. My dad has taught me some really good things in life. My, my skills in driving, I can credit my dad with because he constantly corrected my driving. And now my second job, I drive for a living. So, dad, thank you. But all of us had things that our fathers, our earthly fathers taught us that were good, and then there's things that our earthly fathers taught us that were not so good. And so we can kind of project onto God the Father the things that we learned from our earthly father. And sometimes you have to go step back and go, man, I love my earthly dad. I do. I love you, pops. But my heavenly father has something in store for me that's so much better than my earthly father could ever prepare for me. And he does for you, too. 
Imagine as a parent, most of you guys in the room are parents. Imagine if your kids bought their own Christmas gifts, had to do clean all the chores. Like, what if they just worked and they never just came to be with you? They were just working constantly, trying to be a better person. And you're like, but I already bought you clothes. I already prepared you dinner. Why are you making your own dinner in the microwave? I already, like I made you. A lot of you guys are Christians trying to prepare your own meals and trying to do your own work, not realizing that you have a Father in heaven that will meet all your needs, that he loves you intimately. You can go to him. You can go to him. I think the most, two most powerful words in the English language is Father, help. I pray that a lot. Sometimes I don't know to pray. I said, Father, help. And I just want to tell you a quick story as we close here. I hope you get the sense that God is fathering you. Jesus did. He was constantly being fathered. And it says in Hebrews, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So somehow in suffering, he got closer to the Father. And life can be really tough. And you can, you're going to suffer. I mean, some amens, right? And yet, in suffering, we can get close to the Father if we meet Him in it. And so, a couple of weeks ago, my quiet time, I hadn't journaled in a while. I hate to write. <laughs> I like to read. I hate to write. And some seasons of my life, I journal and just kind of keep a diary with God. And I was journaling one day, and I just felt like God the Father said, Josh, why don't you write down all the things that you're afraid of right now? I'm like, huh, okay. So I took out my journal. I'm in my room, quiet. And I, I could, off the top of my head, I like two things I was thinking of. So I wrote it down. This is kind of stressing me out. I'm afraid of that. And yeah, I'm afraid of that one too. And then I just paused. And then it was like, God was fathering me. He was like, oh yeah, that too. Oh yeah, yeah. And I started writing. I got to eight things in about 20 minutes. I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know that was going on in my soul, all these fears I had. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. So I just paused and said, Father, what are you saying about these things? I need to experience you in these fears, in these stressors in my life. So I just paused there, and I just felt like God bringing his love and peace over me. And then within 24 hours, God took care of two of the fears. Two of them, like, I don't even know, that was a couple weeks ago. They're not even there anymore. And I'm just like, my heart hurts for my church, for you. This message today is my Christmas gift to you. Because a lot of you are dealing with fear. And a lot of you are dealing with stress, and you're disconnected from the Father. And you don't realize that He has good gifts for you, that His Son is preparing a place for you, and you haven't surrendered to Him yet. And you're holding on to fears and trying to... Here's the problem. When you, when you don't give your fears to the Father, you will try to control and manipulate the people around you to not be afraid anymore. <coughs> Let me say that again. When the Father is not in control, and you're trying to do it yourself, you will wear the people out around you because you're trying to control your fears. And Jesus did not do that. He gave all of his fears to the Father. He didn't try to control people. He didn't try to manipulate people. He was always in union with the Father. And the Bible said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? Your salvation. And I really believe this. This is what God revealed to me this week. The joy set before him. The greatest joy had that Jesus, he got to go back and see the Father again. That's what allowed him to endure the cross. For the joy set before him. So we're going to pause for a couple minutes. Josh, would you mind coming up, man? And I really feel like God's saying, give people space to reconnect with the Father. Whatever that looks like for you. I would hate for you to go into 2020, 2022 trying to do everything yourself, trying to be a better Christian, trying to whatever. You just need to release to the Father and receive his love. He loves you. The Bible says in John 17, he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Amen? So we're going to pause now. If you need prayer about that, come forward. Me and Todd are available to pray with you. Maybe just at your seat. You're saying, Father, I'm tired of trying to manipulate things. I'm trying to, tired of trying to control my family. I'm tired of fearing all the time. Father, I know you love me and you have good things for me. I just surrender to you, Father God. And so you can do that at your seat. You can come up to the altars. They're open. You can come pray with me and Todd. I really encourage you. Jesus came at Christmas to reconnect you back to the Father. So give you space for a couple minutes. Just pray through that.
and to me a rich his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen I read this week something so cool, I never thought of it this way. To have faith is to trust, but to have trust is to relax. So to have faith in the Father is to be able to relax into Father. So my prayer for you, I'm going to pray over you right now, that you could relax into God Father, right? Because if you have a kid and they have a boo-boo, you get Paige and Ellie over here, get Cassie over here, when they have an issue, guess what, they run to the Father, they run to their mom. And they said, take care of me. And they just wrapped their arms in. That is, the, that is the impression that God has for you today. So God, I just pray a relaxing, a trust into you, Father God. Jesus, you came to this earth as our Savior, as the commander of angel armies, as our creator. And your goal was to drive us back into the Father. Because that is the reality that you're most aware of, God. And we are aware of a lot of things in this life. But Lord, we have to be aware of your love for us. I just pray an anointing, Lord, a blessing right now of fathering, Lord, everyone in this room. They could leave and start this year with a deep sense of your love for them. And they could relax in your presence. In Jesus' name.